Hello, and welcome to the Gamer's Closet. I'm your host, Douglas Weed, and today we're going to be talking about Battle of the Bulge. Battle of the Bulge is a war game manufactured in 1965 by Avalon Hill. It is a dice rolling game and a peace movement game. The game is for two players, runs for about two hours of game time, and is rated for ages 12 and up. But let's dig into it a little further, shall we? The Battle of the Bulge, also known as the Ardennes Counteroffensive, was the last major German offensive campaign on the Western Front during World War II and took place on December 16, 1944 to January 25, 1945. It was launched through the densely forested Ardennes region of Wallonia in eastern Belgium, northeast France, and Luxembourg towards the end of the war in Europe. The offensive was intended to stop Allied use of the Belgian port of Antwerp and to split the Allied lines, allowing the Germans to encircle and destroy four Allied armies and force the Western Allies to negotiate a peace treaty in the Axis powers' favor. The Germans achieved a total surprise attack on the morning of December 16, 1944 due to a combination of Allied overconfidence, preoccupation with Allied offensive plans, and poor aerial reconnaissance due to bad weather. American forces bore the brunt of the attack and incurred their highest casualties of any operation during the war. The battle also severely depleted Germany's armed forces and they were largely unable to replace them. German personnel and later the Luftwaffe aircraft in the concluding stages of the engagement also sustained heavy losses. Improved weather conditions from around December 24th permitted air attacks on German forces and supply lines which sealed the failure of the offensive. The battle continued for another month before the front lines were effectively restored to its positions prior to the attack. In the wake of the defeat, many experienced German units were left severely depleted of men and equipment as survivors retreated to the defenses of the Siegfried Line. The Bulge was the largest and bloodiest single battle fought by the United States in World War II and the third deadliest campaign in American history. In 1965, Avalon Hill released The Battle of the Bulge, the board game. This is a two-player game where you either play as the Allied forces or the German forces using the same regiments, brigades, and panzer units over a realistic topographical map of the actual battle area. During the same year, the Battle of the Bulge movie was released, but it was loaded with historical inaccuracies. President Eisenhower even came out of retirement to complain about the film. Avalon Hill didn't want the same backlash, so they turned to General Anthony C. McAuliffe, pictured here on the left, the hero of the Battle of Bass Stone. The general was hesitant at first, but with the assurance that Evelyn Hill wanted to create a realistic, historical, accurate game, the general signed on. The Battle of the Bulge is a historically correct recreation of the famous World War II campaign of the same name. The game was well received by the wargaming community and was even reprinted under the Hasbro banner uh, by Avalon Hill in 1991. This game does include multiple pieces. It includes a four-page set of basic instructions, a battle manual, two separate sheets outlining the German and U.S. order of appearance, a two-sided battle results table for the basic game and tournament game, a time record sheet, a full-color game board, which is going to be in two parts, a standard die, and 195 cutout counters, which will include blank counters, and this is for the U.S. and German units. The map board shows the areas of Belgium and Luxembourg where the battle was fought. It covers approximately 2,500 square miles of heavily wooded and rough terrain. Only the roughest and most densely wooded areas have been reproduced on the board. A hexagonal grid has been printed on the board to determine movement. Hereafter, the hexagons will be referred to as squares. Terrain features are as follows. Rough terrain squares are any square containing brown splash contours. Dense wooded squares are squares containing green splotches. River squares are any square containing blue flow lines. Road squares are any square containing parallel black lines. Town squares are any square that have black crisscross lines. Towns are outlined with a heavy hex border or fortresses, which are pertinent only in the advanced tournament game. Grid coordinates are the letter columns running north and south. Number columns angled northwesterly to pinpoint locations. For example, the town of Bastogne it will be on DD32, and the town of St. Vith will be on QQ15. 
Now that we've looked at the map, let's take a look at the units themselves. Pictured here are the combat units that you will use in the game. Blue for the U.S. forces and red for the German forces. The numbers pictured on the bottom of each of these tiles are going to be their attack value and movement value. The left number for being attacked, the right number for movement. The number pictured on the left side of the, each of the pieces is going to be the division number. For example, in the center here we have the 5th division. On the number on the right is their regiment number. In this particular case, this is going to be the 2nd regiment. The stat on top of the little box will include either if it's going to be a brigade or combat command, which will show the letter X, or three ones, which it stands for a regiment. Last but not least, there are five different types of units in the game, which the center box represents each individual type. If there's an X in the middle of the box, it stands for infantry or Volksgrenadier, if it's U.S. or German. If it is a circle with one line through, it stands for armored cavalry. If it is a circle with no line through it, it stands for armor or a panzer. If it has a circle with two lines through it, basically making an X, it stands for a panzer grenadier. And last but not least, if there's an X through the box with a little circle on the bottom, it stands for a parachute unit. To set up this game, lay the map board out on the table. The German player sits on the eastern side, the US player sits on the western side. Place your units on the corresponding space provided on each player's order of appearance card. The U.S. player sets up their units on the map board first. The U.S. player refers to all of the units that are listed at start on the order of appearance card and places them directly on the map board on the exact squares indicated. The German player then sets up their units in the same manner. The listing for at start is considered the first turn of the game. The routine of play for every turn is as follows. Step 1, the German player consults the time record card, and if there is new units, places them on the map board, then moves all units on the board that they choose. No U.S. movement is allowed. Step 2, all battles caused by German movement are resolved one battle at a time. Step 3, the U.S. player consults the time record card, and if they are due new units, then places them on the map board. They then get to move all units on the board they choose to move. No German movement is allowed at this time. Step 4, all battles caused by U.S. movement are resolved one battle at a time. And finally, step 5, the U.S. player checks off one box of the time record card, and players repeat step 1 through through 5 through main of the game. For the German player to win, they can win by two options. One, they get 20 units across the Meuse River between S-16 and A-47, inclusive by their December 23rd PM turn, or two, eliminate all U.S. units from the map board. Units yet to come on the map board would be also considered eliminated. For the U.S. player to win, they have to avoid the German conditions of victory by the December 30th p.m. turn. To move your units, move any, all, or none of your units on your movement turn. You may move each unit any number of squares not exceeding its normal movement rate, which will be the number on the bottom right of your unit square. You do not have to move every unit, nor do you have to move any unit in your turn. You may move units in any direction or combination of directions you wish in the same turn. You may move units over the top of friendly units, but you are not allowed to move your units on top or over opponent's units. Movement rates are not transferable from one unit to another, nor can they be accumulated from from one turn to the next. You are not allowed to move units through map board edges squares that contain grid letters and numbers. Unlike chess or checkers, you may move all of your units you wish to move before resolving any battles. Please note that the die is used only to resolve battles. It has nothing to do with movement. Both players are allowed to combine units of any kind in a stacking total up to three units maximum. Stacked units may stay together indefinitely or they may be combined on one turn and split up on the very next. Stacked units may pass over other squares containing other friendly units. The movement rate of stacked units is that of the slowest unit in the stack. Otherwise, the faster unit in the stack may continue on its way after splitting up from the slow moving units.
Movement along roads is five times faster than normal. Thus, a unit whose normal movement rate of four can move 20 squares along a road in one turn. In other words, movement along five road squares is the same as one clear terrain square. All units may combine road travel with off-road travel in the same turn. For instance, let's assume a unit with a normal movement rate of four is two squares away from a road. As soon as it moves to the road square, it can travel up to 10 more squares along the road or up to five more squares along the road and one uh, off-road square. Please note, units lose the benefits of fractions. For example, if the unit I just mentioned had moved six squares along the road instead of five, it could no longer move off-road that turn. All units may change roads at intersections at the road movement rate. All units may move through towns at the road movement rate, but only if they enter and leave the town by road squares. Otherwise, travel through towns is done at a normal movement rate. Rough terrain are the brown splotches pictured in this photo. Movement through rough terrain is naturally slower than normal. Thus, all units, regardless of their normal movement rates, move through non-road rough terrain squares at the rate of one square per turn. All units must stop as soon as they move on to a non-road rough terrain square. They cannot proceed until their following turn. Units that enter rough terrain by a road square do not have to stop on the first rough terrain square as long as they stay on the road. Units that enter a rough terrain square must stop if entry is made from a square other than a road square. For instance, if a unit would stop on space TT19 if it entered from UU19, but if it entered from UU18, it could continue right on through the rough terrain along the road. All units move through rough terrain along roads at the normal road movement rate. All units leave non-road rough terrain squares at a normal movement rate. Units moving through rough terrain on roads may move one square onto a non-road rough terrain square in the same turn. Units beginning their turn on non-road rough terrain squares may move one square onto a rough terrain road square and then move along the road in the same turn. They may not, however, move off the road onto another rough terrain square in that turn. Units beginning their turn on a non-road rough terrain square may not cross a rough terrain road square and onto a second rough terrain square. Pictured here on the bottom right are dense wood squares. Armor, panzers, armored cavalry, and panzer grenadier units are not allowed on non-road wood squares. They are allowed in woods only along road squares, and they must enter and leave the woods by the same non-road wood squares. All other units move through the woods in the same exact fashion as I just mentioned in the rough terrain section. Rivers are pictured here as the long blue lines. Movement across rivers is sometimes slower than normal. Thus, a unit must end its turn as soon as it reaches a non-road river square it intends to cross at that point. All units may cross rivers on road squares and town squares without delay. If units do not wish to cross, they may move onto a non-road river square and then proceed up or down the river and then move off of the river on the same side from which they entered, all in the same turn and at the normal movement rate. Movement off of the opposite side of the river is not allowed in this case. All units may move onto a non-road river square, proceed up or down the river, and then cross over to the other side by a road square where it may continue up or down the river and leave altogether, all in the same turn. All units may leave the end of the river in any direction it wishes. All units beginning their turn on a river square may move off on the other side or up and down the river and leave from any point off either side in the same turn. Movement along rivers through rough terrain and dense woods is subject to the same rough terrain and dense wood movement rates that I have just previously mentioned. Over time, both sides will gain reinforcements. As indicated by the time record card, new units come onto play through the course of the game. Such units are brought on board as directed by the order of its appearance card. New units may be placed on the board in squares directly in the enemy zones of control. Every unit's zone of control is at six adjacent squares, A through F as pictured here on the left, regardless of which square it is on. A unit's zone of control even extends across rivers and into dense woods and rough terrain. You automatically cause combat when you move a unit into one square of an opponent unit's zone of control. 
The player moving their unit is always the attacker. The opponent is the defender. To determine battle odds, the attacker's combat factor is stated first, and the defender's combat factor is stated second. For example, as pictured here, we have the Fuhrer Escort Brigade, 12, attacking the 501st Airborne Regiment, 4. Battle odds are 12 to 4, which reduces to 3 to 1. To resolve combat, the attacker rolls the die once and matches up the die roll with the 3 to 1 odds column on the battle results table. When attacking, an attacking unit must stop as soon as it enters the first enemy controlled square. You are not allowed to move an attacking unit through an enemy controlled square. You may attack as many enemy units as you can reach in the same turn. You may move as many units into the enemy zones of control as you are able before resolving combat. You resolve all combat one battle at a time after moving all of your units you choose in to move on your turn. The attacker has the choice of resolving battles in any order they wish. The attacker must resolve combat against every enemy unit they have moved units next to. The combat factor of a unit when attacking is always basic regardless of terrain it is attacking from. When defending, the defender player is not allowed to move any unit while their opponent is attacking. The combat factor of a unit when defending varies according to the terrain it is defending on. Examples are shown on the battle results table. When two or more units attack one defending unit, the factors of the attacking unit must be totaled into one combined combat factor. When one unit attacks two or more defending units, the factors of the defending units must be totaled into one combined combat factor. When several units attack several defending units, the attacker has the choice of dividing combat into more than one battle as long as A, they battle every defending unit, their attacking units are adjacent to, and B, their units are adjacent to the specific units they are attacking. The combat factor of a unit cannot be split and applied to more than one battle. The attacker with stacked units on the same square may divide combat into more than one battle against defending units on separate squares. The attacker may not divide combat into more than one battle against defending units on the same square. You may deliberately sacrifice one or more attacking units at unfavorable odds in order to gain more favorable odds over other defending units. This tactic is called soaking off. Soaking off odds cannot be worse than 1 to 6. No unit attacking or defending can fight more than one battle in any one player's turn, even if it finds itself adjacent to the enemy after all battles have been resolved. In this event, the defending unit must either attack or withdraw in its turn. If it chooses to attack, it may do so staying where it is or by withdrawing from the enemy zone altogether and then re-entering by a different square. In this instance, units may not withdraw and re-enter by a route that would force them into or through zones of control of other enemy units. To use the basic game battle results table, follow the following steps. Step 1, reduce battle odds to the basic odds shown on the battle results table. To do this, simply divide the defender's factor into the attacker's factor and round off any fraction in favor of the defender. For example, 16 to 9 converts to 1 to 1, 14 to 6 converts to 2 to 1, 4 to 15 converts 1 to 4, etc. Step 2, the die is rolled for each attack by the attacker. And finally, step three, the die is rolled and match it up with the basic odds to get the results of the attack. For example, three to one attack with a die roll of three means the defender is pushed back two squares. Well, this covers the rules for the basic game, but if you do wish to have a stronger game, I suggest checking the battle manual because it has all of the instructions for the tournament game, which adds greater realism and depth into play of this game. Well, this has been an overview of Battle of the Bulge. Battle of Volge is a very uh, interesting strategy game from Avalon Hill. Uh, it has a nice time element for when pieces come in, so it's always adding reinforcements. Uh, the game runs very smoothly. It runs very easily. Uh, the basic mode that I've already covered here is great for novice players, but like I said, it does come with an advanced mode for war gamers or experienced strategy game players that want a beefier game. So it does have a novice and an advanced option, which is really nice. So that way, if you're not really familiar with war games, you can start on the basic mode and work your way into the advanced. So it has a very nice option to it. It has a very nice replayability. It's very easy to play, very easy to pick up. The basic mode is um, not very complicated. The advanced mode gets into a little more in terrain, gets into more um, 
different types of graphs and uh, movement options depending on weather conditions. So it has more options behind it. Um, the game itself goes online for anywhere from about $20 to $40, so it's not really hard to get a hold of. It has had a couple of different printings over the years, and the printings are pretty close to the original here, but um, they're kind of a little cleaned up a little bit. They have nicer looking graphics on the board, nicer pieces. So uh, the advanced versions or the, or the later reprint versions are a little nicer than the original, but the original holds up to anything that they have. So they are comparable. If you haven't played Battle of the Bulge before, I would recommend picking it up. Like I said, it's very easy. It's very kid friendly. And if you're looking to get into strategy games, this is a really good option for you to start on. So if you haven't played this game, I would recommend playing it. Well, that's it from us here at the Gamer's Closet. We'd like to thank you for checking out our video on Battle of the Bulge from Avalon Hill. If there's a game in the future you would like us to review or go over, please put it in the comments below. Please hit subscribe so that we can be the first to check out our future content. And as always, please have a great gaming day.